now to hear from, from more of our surgeons a little more in depth. Um, I have the uh, honor and privilege and joy of actually getting to introduce a dear friend, uh, Todd Ponsky. Um, Todd is from Cleveland, so I actually, re I actually remember when he was a medical student um, and I was uh, a new attending. Um, so we, we go back a little bit. Um, Todd is really just an amazing guy. Not only is he an amazing surgeon, um, but he is truly an innovator. Um, really one of the first people to do any sort of minimally invasive procedures in peds at, at Rainbow. Um, and also has innovated as, um, as his uh, mentor and colleague said, how knowledge within pediatric surgery is being disseminated and, and how we're teaching and training people, not only that are here, but around the world. And Todd has really been um, a leader in, in developing systems where people are learning about surgeries in real time all over the world, and sometimes from his living room. So, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of research, a lot of innovation. There is not much that Todd can't do, so I'm going to have him join me on stage to tell us about what he's working on now. Todd. All right. Uh, we're gonna, before we get started on talking about how things are going to radically change, for those of you who love this meeting, the next one is 2021 in Phoenix. And what is special about this, woohoo! The special about this is that it's actually combined, it's the mega meeting of the century. It is combined with the two largest pediatric surgical societies that are finally coming together. So we need surgeons involved in this society. We need surgeons involved in innovation. And so this will be a, a week-long mega meeting of surgery and innovation. All right, here we go. We're gonna talk about some bias borders and boredom and how we get rid of all this stuff and how things are radically gonna change uh, coming soon. So you know how it's totally rude to take out your phone while someone's trying to give a talk? Well, not today. I say, go ahead. I don't think this QR code does much. You can try it. Go out today. Go out right now. Take out your phone. And we're going to have QR codes throughout this. So if there's something you're interested in, go ahead and uh, get the QR code. For those of you who, who don't know how to do it, you can open up your camera and aim it at the screen. There you go. I did a little demo in my hotel room. All right. Totally can't see because the lights. But so who here, who here, if you were on who wants, who knows the answer to this, by the way? Okay, good. So if you were on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and you did not know the answer, you have three lifelines. You're all familiar with the lifelines, everybody? Okay, so who would choose to limit them to 50-50? One, two, three, four, five, six. Who would call an absolute expert in the field, the smartest person you know in that space? Most of you. Who would ask the uninformed audience who would ask the uninformed audience? Okay, I'm not gonna tell you the answer now, you're gonna have to wait to find out the answer. By the way, do you know the answer to that question? Richard Nixon. Okay, we are gonna talk about, I believe that the cornerstone of medicine, what is the foundation of medicine is academics, is how we get up on stage and share information, how we publish and share information, I'm gonna tell you that it's totally broken. And I will promise you that you will see radical changes in academic medicine, and they're gonna be for the better. And why? So we've seen disruption like we've never seen before. And you know what's fascinating? If you go back to 1970, and you look at the, how long a company lasted, and the S&P 500 is about 50 years. So an S&P 500 company would still be S&P 500 at 50 years. What do you think it is now? Guess. Do I see it 30 years, 20 years? It's 12 years. Right now, a company lasts in the S&P only 12 years. So get ready to be disrupted because if you're at the top of the game, you ain't gonna be there much longer. Times are changing. So we have to prepare for the future, and I'm going to tell you that academic medicine is one of those things that's going to be disrupted. This book totally changed me. Who's read this book? Got to read this book. This book, The Age of Acceleration, although, Dan, you thought it was kind of boring a little bit, but I thought it was a great book. Thomas Friedman, he talks about why are things so rapidly changing now? Why are there companies that are top of their game crashing overnight? 
It's because things are accelerating at a speed we've never seen before. We keep hearing about Moore's law and the doubling of computing power. Everything is doubling. So things, the game has completely changed to what we were used to before. And one of the most disrupted industries is the publishing industry. We look at magazines. Look what's happened to magazine sales in the UK. Let's talk about the publishing uh, newspapers. This was the rise of newspapers into a mega billion, it was peaked at like $70 billion. And then one day, the internet came out, Google comes out, and it tanked. That's the newspaper industry. But you know what's fascinating about this graph? They tried to recover. They said, oh, well, we can copy. We'll wait and see what someone else does. Let's copy Google. And that didn't quite work out. You can't react anymore like you used to be able to. If you're not ahead of the curve, you're out. You're out. So if newspapers and magazines have been disrupted, why won't academic publishing get disrupted as well? And I will tell you, I promise you, it will look completely different in a very short period of time from now. How we share information around the world will change. So I would say that if you ask me what's the purpose of academic medicine, I think, I mean, at least this is what I would say, that the purpose of academic medicine is to disseminate knowledge around the world. That's my definition. That's why we do it. There's a lot of other side benefits. That's a purpose. And I would say that how are we doing with disseminating knowledge around the world? And I would say we completely suck. It's terrible. We think it's great because we're in these first world countries, but in the developing nations, it's not the same. And I would say to you that in 2019, I get that there are disparities in care. I get it. There's financial disparities. I get that they might not be able to afford the robot. But I would say to you that we should all believe, at least I do, that it is completely unacceptable that in 2019 there's disparities in knowledge. How the hell can there be disparities in knowledge in 2019? Big disparities in knowledge. It's because of money and access. Here's another problem with academic medicine. Right now, as we speak, there is someone in some country somewhere giving the most incredible lecture, and none of us will ever hear it. We're in silos, giving lectures, all independently. You only know what country you're in. You hear what's talked about in your region, and you don't know anything else that's going on in the world. And here's the biggest problem. This is the one we're going to talk about. We've been hearing Moore's Law and everything doubling. This is the graph of exponential growth of medical publications. This is medical knowledge. Now, if you, it's the same thing again. If you go back into the 1950s and said, how long would it take for medical knowledge to double? The answer is it would be 50 years. And this is the acceleration thing. They said, oops, uh, I mean, seven years. In 1980, things sped up. So the rate that it would take for all of the medical knowledge that you're supposed to know would double every seven years. In, nine, in 2010, it went down to three and a half years. Now it's 70 days. Every 73 days, the amount of information that we're supposed to know is doubling. This is insanity. So to tell me that we think we're going to just keep standing up on a stage and think that we can podium medical knowledge to death is never going to work. We have to change how we're getting this. Now, who's heard of the, 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 the chessboard? OK, only a few of you. All right. So we talk about exponential growth. I keep saying things are doubling. And it sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Well, let me tell you how much it is. So once upon a time, this man invents a chessboard, and he takes the chessboard to the king, and he shows the king of India the chessboard, and the king says, this is the most amazing game I've ever seen in my whole life. What can I do to repay you? And the man says, I'm very simple. All I want is rice. And he says, okay, how much rice do you want? And he says, well, let's play a game. Let's put one grain of rice on the first square and keep doubling it, two, and then four, and then eight, and double it, and I'll take it home. And the king says, no problem, and he starts doubling the rice, and he realizes he gets to the second row, it's becoming a problem because one big number becomes a huge number and then eventually the whole room of the palace starts to fill up with rice. Then the entire palace fills up with rice and then the entire country of India fills up with three feet of rice. That's the power of doubling and that's what we are in right now. We are experiencing the age of acceleration, the power of doubling. By the way, 18 quintillion pieces of rice if you're counting. So, What's happening now is because there's so much publications, there's so much knowledge that a good paper, a Sentinel article, is completely hidden by all the other stuff that everyone else is publishing. 
so you can't find what's important. When doctors from 30 years ago finished their career, beginning and end of their career, they were able to handle the new publications. They were able to keep up. But this is us now. Big difference. We're on the second half of the chessboard. It is impossible for us to keep up. So how will digital solve this? How are we going to get this into people's heads? Here's the answer. It's going to take a couple minutes. We're going to load pediatric surgery into your brain in the morning, and you'll be good. Not that far from truth, by the way. <laughs> Neural Lace, Elon Musk's new company. We're not that far from this. But this, 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 we're not quite there yet. So we got to think of something else. So I see Anthony over there. Anthony, you changed me big time. One, last year, you showed me a book. So this is how we get information now. Would you all agree that it's textbooks, medical societies, and journals? This is how we get knowledge. And I would tell you that there's three new ways we're going to get knowledge. And Anthony, you showed me this book. It was a huge... Th what this book said is that the three biggest influences in, in the future, in the digital world in the future, will be machines, platforms, and crowds. What do I mean by that? Machine, machine learning, we've been hearing about that. Platforms, how do we share information? Not just the standard ways of doing it, but thinking of new platforms, digital platforms, and the crowd. So let's talk about machines, machine learning. How can we use machine learning to address this problem? This problem of overabundance of information. What if we could create a machine learning filter that could use natural language processing to filter out, because that's what an editorial board does. They look at words. They look at the relationship of words. Why can't the machine learn to do this? So we're, uh, in Cincinnati, we're working on an algorithm to try to decipher quality, and we're going to validate that against editorial boards. Whether that's not a good validation, I don't know, but we're going to try to create an uh, NLPE algorithm to help filter through and tell us what sh we should be paying attention to. Now we're going to move into the crowd. So if you guessed 50-50, 50%. If you guessed phone a friend, an absolute expert, you'd be right 66% of the time. If you ask the uninformed audience who know nothing, you're going to be right 91% of the time. The crowd is always smarter than the core of experts. Holy crap, that is totally different than everything else that we've been taught, right? We rely on the core of the experts always. And I am, I, what I've learned, what we have to understand is that we have to be better at embracing the crowd. So Francis Galton, Francis Galton did an experiment. He took an ox to the state fair and he asked 100, 800 people the weight of the ox. And they said, it's 1,197 pounds. I mean, we're talking six-year-old kids up to... 90-year-old men, we have no, everything you can imagine. Absolutely no knowledge about oxes. They guessed 1,198. This experiment was just repeated two years ago. The exact same results, except it was two pounds off. The crowd is brilliant, and we are not very good at using the crowd. This is how we're going to get to truth and knowledge in the future. So let's talk about the crowd. So how... How is the crowd used right now? So there are 5 billion videos on YouTube, yet I guarantee you in this room, some of us have seen the same videos. Now, how is that possible? 5 billion videos and some of us have seen. It's because of the crowd. It's because we rely on the crowd to tell us what's good. Now, that's a good question about how do you determine what's good, but we rely on the crowd to rise stuff to the top. And can this be applied to how we decide what information? Do we need editorial boards anymore. Let's look at what happens. The people writing the paper don't want to get paid. They just want to share their knowledge with the world. And the people reading the papers, they just want information. So you have someone who writes something and wants the world to see it, and you have everyone who wants it. And we used to have publishing companies because we needed to have the, them printed. We had to have them uh, put in bound and then distributed. But we don't need either of those anymore. Why do we need publishing companies? Anyone here from a publishing company? We don't need publishing companies anymore. Why can't we rely on this? Well, actually, it's happening. It's really happening. Has anyone heard of SSRN, the Social Science Research Network? This is not medicine. It's a little bit of medicine. But this is the pre-peer review 
database where people can submit their papers and let the crowd read them and edit them and, and move things up to good or bad and rise to the top. Maybe we don't even, this is, this is working already in social sciences, why can't we do the same thing in medicine? Let the crowd edit and decide what's good. So this is why I think the crowd will disrupt medical publishing. If you look at the music industry, over time, this is, the, this is how it works. They make an album. It's got like 10 songs on it, right? And they had all these different methods of sending it out over time. So there was vinyl and cassettes and compact discs. But over time, the music industry was rising until one day, Napster came along. And look what happened to the music industry. It tanked. The music industry tanked because they weren't prepared for the digital disruption of music. They're recovering now because they're realizing about Spotify and subscription services. They're learning. Okay, so this is a lot of parallels to medical publishing. Has anyone heard of Sci-Hub? This is our Napster. Sci-Hub is an open database of pretty much every single paper. It is there. And guess what? I was talking to Elsevier and someone from Springer. They can't stop it. Welcome to Napster. How do they not see the writing on the wall? We have people that are trying to get their stuff out, people that are trying to, to get it, and no one cares about getting paid, and we have a place for it to be distributed. I'm telling you, I believe that the, everything is gonna change. It's gonna be very much like YouTube. And there's one more thing that the crowd will solve. So every year, we do a lot of courses. And someone pointed something out to me about the, the faculty of my course. Do you notice anything about the faculty of my course? They're all white men. And someone said, you had all white men on your panel. And I said, but that was a fluke. I had one, it was a three women, they canceled. It was, you know, we had all different ethnicities, but it was just canceled. They go, oh yeah? What about 2017? And what about 2016? And 2014? All white men. I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe you. It's totally true. I'm completely biased. So. My fellows put me to the test because I said there's no way I am biased. So we took the test. So about a few weeks ago, we did the annual update course. And what a lot of people noticed is that my faculty for the past couple of years have been mostly white men. It was explained to me that this may be something called unconscious bias. This is the idea that men and women subconsciously have a bias towards white men. So I was challenged by my research fellows, Ray Hankey and Alex Kassar, to take a quiz to see if I'm truly biased or not. So we're gonna go ahead and take the test and we'll look at the results. Done. I cannot believe that. So the question here is, um, what is what is everyone else out there? So uh, why will digital solve this? We did a little test. We chose the nominating committee for our organization, then we let digital try to choose the nominating committee. It was the most diverse selection of people because the answer to unconscious bias is not trying to mandate different people in different positions, it's removing the system that we've been using to decide who's what and what's what. And we have to, using digital might be a great way to end bias. Now we're gonna get into the final thing, which is platform. These are the two ways that we get information out. We publish or podium. I want to argue that we should be using more digital platforms. And when you look at, I, I learn everything from my kids. What is it about how they get information? The younger crowd is getting information from digital videos, from videos, from music, and they're entertaining. That's how they get everything from YouTube. It's entertaining, engaging, short pieces of information. So why are we not teaching medicine that way? I mean, it works for everyone else. Why do we have to be boring and long-winded in healthcare? So what if we could take content and take it from boring to fun and multimedia and make it engaging, edutainment, and then use digital to distribute it around the world? So that's what we've been working on over the years is trying to figure out if we can democratize knowledge around the world and get more people to pay attention to what's, what's good. This is our way of curating what's important. So instead of a conference, what if we do digital conferences? Well, geography is no longer an issue for doctors to share vital medical information. Imagine the best pediatric trauma experts in the world gathered in one place teaching doctors globally. Only the experts never had to leave their office. I know you're there. I can see you. 
Anything you want to add to this? <laughs> <laughs> That's obviously going to be a bit of a selection bias, and 60% of And um, those work very, very well. And if you give them a little bit of time to set, so after you, you put the guest right yeah. 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 yeah, my yeah. experience has been these babies are almost like two kilos or smaller. It's a little jaundice, and I'm not sure if you guys can see the eyes, but it's clearly a carrot. But like the lion myoma is very different. But see, as a pathologist, you diagnose everything later. So the question <laughs> is, okay, how do we diagnose it before we do the operation? Wow, I did not know that. Mark the time. Right now, 3.45 p.m., I have changed my practice. Okay. So, Jim, I've never seen this trick of grabbing the tip of the Foley to set up each urethral bite. It works well. Do you do it all the time? Yeah. I do. Ever since I was a little boy. So, I'm cutting it short. We, we, there are five hospitals right now that have come together each year to create conferences completely digital. We worked with NBC to figure out how to make it fun and exciting and entertaining. You all right? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so, uh, we worked with NBC to try to make it fun, entertaining, and engaging. And uh, we now have um, 3,000 people that watch these, and they're pretty exciting. Instead of journal articles, we can use now digital media, so we try to curate the best stuff into it. This is Todd Ponsky with the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, and today we're going to address a hot topic of debate in the operating room, which is the safest headgear to wear in the operating room. Is it this? Is it this? Or is it this? Well, this... So, <laughs> these take time, but we've been making these all, we've okay. these all day long. Every is day it this? So it's, the problem is it takes a lot of time and work, but uh, the, this, these are becoming really popular. <laughs> so then we take it, we throw it out on social media. Here's my fellow presenting a paper. He had 300 people in the room watching him. The next week we had 50,000 people on Facebook. So you tell me what's better, podium or digital? Who likes Facebook? Who doesn't like, who doesn't like Facebook? Right. So. We're trying to figure out a new platform, and so we're getting away from social media. We need to have protected platforms of knowledge, so we've created something that has a feed of publications that you choose, videos, uh, everything you can imagine. It's all free to the world, treatment guidelines, a way for people to talk to each other, podcasts, everything, CME, it's all free for the whole world. Um, and this is a, a little... to stabilize and actually correct it. In last year, we published in Science Translational Medicine. What do you do with a 100-day-old infant that presents? It's a very familiar question, to be honest. And... The only thing that's attaching the lesion, and so the assumption is, is that there's a vessel in there. So this is our way of trying to democratize knowledge. We're giving it to the world for free and trying to make sure that the first world countries don't have an advantage over the developing nations. And the final thing I want to talk about for the last two minutes is surgical solitude. This is the other way I think digital is really going to impact surgery. The culture is that surgeons are by themselves, and I don't believe that it should be that case. If you look at the pilots, they always have a co-pilot, but surgeons, we love being by ourselves. We just take care of these big operations by ourselves, and I think we can do better with mentorship. This was on Memorial Day. I get a phone call on WhatsApp. The guy, uh, Santiago Chile, is calling us and saying, we're having a tough case. Can you give us some suggestions? This is a guy from Ecuador, a guy from Colombia, and me in Cleveland, and uh, we're all working together to help him through this tough case. So this is something we've been doing a lot of called surgical telementoring. Uh, and maybe one interface lower. Oh, you know what you're gonna get to be able to do? You're gonna get to do a superior segment. You think so? Yeah. Yep. So the scope is in the perfect place. Go where my circle is. So here's minor fissure. Yeah. All right, here's the front of the major fissure. Yeah. 
So what I would do is I'd come right here and unroof the top of the cyst and carry it all the way back so we can see how it really separates from the vessels in the upper lobe. This plane right here. Yeah. So do we have enough surgeons to spend their time teaching? I don't think we do, so why can't we use AI? So right now we're working on developing the system where we are loading images uh, into a machine learning system for image recognition. Can we teach surgical technique uh, to a machine learning um, algorithm so it could find hazard prevention? And so this is the final uh, slide. This is a, a mock-up of what it could look like. The scope is in the perfect place. I think it's best to make your incision right here. Here is the minor fissure. Here is the front of the major fissure. I would start right here and unroof the cyst. So academic medicine will be disrupted. We will help identify what's important. We will help end bias. We will come together and stop surgical solitude. We will democratize knowledge around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yep. Do we have time? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. How are these guys going to, how are academicians going to get promoted in that new system? And I, I agree that everything you say we should happen, but how does, how's the promotion scheme going to catch up to that? Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question right yes. back to you. Okay, so you get urology fellows coming to Texas. Yes. Now be honest with me. Uh -huh. If they said, well, hey, I didn't write papers, but I made a lot of great videos, uh -huh. would you take them? Probably not at this point. <laughs> right. So even those, even us who are promoting this, yeah. we still have the same bias, right? right? So I think we have a far way to go. We are writing a paper this year called the Modern Day CV, right. and that we have to realize that what is quality publications? Dan, what's your choice? Would you, does that, would you like someone who's done videos at Cincinnati Children's? That's, that's not the way you evaluate either. So I think we have a long way to go. I think we need to figure out how to put, um, how to put value to a non-traditional publication. Um, we, have, I, we have something called Figshare where you can like, put a DOI to anything. So we put DOIs to our videos, to our podcasts. I think over time we're going to start seeing different looking curriculum vitae and different uh, uh, promoting committees that will look at different standards, but it's a long way to go. Yes, sir. Thank you. With the telementoring that you were doing, you had three mentors uh, to the one request. Do you find that's a pretty typical turnout? Three mentors to the one request. So we, you're saying if, I, if the surgeon, one surgeon for three mentors? So there was one surgeon that was operating and then there was three people that was assisting? Uh, oh, 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 in the, in the WhatsApp video? That's correct, yeah. yes. So um, that, that's a little, di when we do formal telementoring, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. There are people that suggest the most efficient way to do that is to line up a bunch of cases on one day where an expert can look at all the screens at once. Um, we, uh, that was a case of a friend using digital technology saying, hey, I'm stuck, just start calling all my friends, and we were all watching them. That was completely off the cuff, uh, no, no, no pre-design for that. But that's, the problem with telementoring is not the technology. The problem is legal, because the surgeon giving advice is technically liable for anything that goes wrong, and it's the business model. Why would surgeons take time out of their day? C yes, we're doing it for research, but when push comes to shove, are we gonna really spend half of our week helping other surgeons at other hospitals. We have to figure out the business model. Any other questions? Perfect.